Joe Benning, Senator from California. <clears throat> and Charlie Hinton on the drums. Good morning. Good morning. Ashley Berliner, I'm the Director of Medicaid Policy at the Agency of Human Services. Thank you for having me this morning. So I am here with four rules, and I noticed the agenda had two pharmacy rules, a surgery rule, and another pharmacy rule. So if it's okay with the committee, I'd love to do all three pharmacy rules together um, before we get into the, the surgery rule. Here, no objection. Um, the floor is yours to preview all three of those. We may very well choose to go to them one at a time. Absolutely. So the first rule, 19P47, is an amendment to the V Farm prescribed drug rules. This rule, um, unlike most of the rules that I come in front of this committee with, is staying under a V Farm rule structure. It's not moving into the HCAR framework right now, the healthcare administrative rules. Um, this rule amends the pharmacy program for the V Farm only population. It changes prescription refills from five refills per year to 11 refills per year, which we think will help beneficiaries, pharmacies, and prescribers alike. Um, it will reduce the issues happening at the pharmacy. It will require fewer prescription renewals, and um, the regulations governing prescribing patterns don't change, so we don't perceive any um, differences in overprescribing as a result of this increase in refill limits. It's updated to align with current state and federal rules, and like all of the rules that I'm going to be in front of you with today, we had public engagement that included sharing the rules with all of the AHS departments and external stakeholders, <coughs> including pharmacists, Vermont Legal Aid, Vermont Medical Society, the Vermont Associations of Hospitals and Health Systems, and the Medicaid and Exchange Advisory Board. For the three pharmacy rules that I'm here in front of you for, we did not receive any public comment. Do you have any questions on the particular rule? Senator Byers. Yeah, on the clean text, there is a typo. One, two, three, fourth paragraph down that begins with licensed physician. It says without an AV available. Thank you. We will make that change. And interestingly, it's it's not there on the annotated text. Yes, which kind of just track changing. <laughs> it's hard to clean it up perfectly. Thanks for pointing that out. So on the on the uh, eleven refills, um, the, this this will not be in conflict with the um, opioid uh, rules. No. Prescribing rules. No, it doesn't change any of the underlying prescribing okay. guidelines. <clears throat> I'm with approval if we want to do it that way. Help the chair here. We're, you've presented P47, and, and you've just given that single one. Yes. Okay. With approval of 19P47. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> say nay, and it has been approved. <clears throat> the witness continues on P19, P48. Uh, is that correct? Yes. So this is uh, parallel to the VFARM rule that I just described, but it's for the entire Medicaid population. Um, so again, changes the refill, annual refills from 5 to 11. Um, and it also incorporates many of the uh, stipulations that were previously specified in Rule 7501, which I'll talk about in a minute, which we're repealing. So this um, really takes the place of both uh, the prescribed drugs rule and the old Medicaid rule framework and the pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, and equipment rule. So you'll see lots of incorporation and the track changes version there. So in reading these, many of the uh, descriptions, brief summaries, etc., word for word the same with uh, the substitution of Medicaid for uh, VFARM? Um, the substitution of Medicaid for VFARM and then also the incorporation of large uh, sections of the pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, and equipment rule. 
and that specifically um, talks about qualified providers who are pharmacies, the definition of maintenance drugs, conditions for coverage, um, eligibility for care around the dual medi Medicaid, Medicare, um, compound prescriptions and unused drugs are all some of the, they're all incorporated from the repeal rule. That's also in front of you. Any questions? Oh, I'm confused as to how this thing was put together with us, for us. The first oh, page. backwards. Hmm? Yeah, it's backwards. Yeah, I guess that's what it was put together backwards. <coughs> I, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens? So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, because it's, you know, it starts with 7502, but the, the clean text is 4.207 that way. So, okay, that's all I needed to know. We weren't missing something or something. Otherwise, I'll move approval of the rule. Representative Myers, thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I've turned around. <laughs> um, Sir Nabeni, please. Move that the rule be approved. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The rule has been approved. Witness. The next rule, 19P46, is a repeal of our pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, and equipment general information rule. Um, this is something that was largely incorporated in the previous rule that I just spoke about regarding prescribed drugs. Um, and so rather than move um, two rules into the new HR framework, we thought it more appropriate to combine them for clarity and brevity. This is this is just a re repeal, in which case then I will move approval. For the two of them. Nineteen P forty six. Any questions? <coughs> um, Representative Myers has moved that the rule be approved, which repeals the uh, conditions under the previous two rules that we just. If there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All those in nay, and we have approved, approved, approved the repeals. So the next rule is P is 19P49. This is a brand new rule under the Medicaid program for gender affirmation surgery for the treatment of gender dysphoria. Um, this is a big rule. Um, we have been working on this rule for a really long time. We've had lots of public engagement. We've shared the rule with stakeholders prior to formal rulemaking and then opened it up for public comment again as part of a formal APA process. We've shared it with the Medicaid Exchange Advisory Board, pharmacists, Vermont Legal Aid, Vermont Medical Society, Vermont Associations of Hospitals and Health Systems, Outright Vermont, Pride Center of Vermont, the UVM Transgender Youth Center, Community Health Center of Burlington, and UVM MC providers. Um, we have had over 30 drafts of this rule and are uh, really, I frankly am really proud of where we've ended up um, and largely due to Danny Fiacco and her work. Um, We've received over 200 comments on this rule, which in my five years of doing rulemaking, it is like 10 times on our rules, rule comments we've ever had. So we've received lots and lots of public engagement. Um, not surprisingly, pretty, pretty split between um, comments that were hugely supportive of the rule and comments largely from outside the state that were not supportive of the rule. Um, this, you may or may not be aware that this rule got picked up um, in the national media, Breitbart News, um, ran some stories about it, and um, we ended up getting lots of comment from, I believe, the United Kingdom related to this rule um, in opposition. So we had we had over 200 comments, like I said, um, but the Vermont population was um, largely in support of it. 
we did make several changes as a result of the comments received and you'll see that reflected in the annotated version so because it's a brand new rule the annotated changes in front of you are what we changed as a result of the public comments um, to summarize what is in this rule, it largely codifies and updates our current clinical criteria. Vermont Medicaid has been covering surgeries for gender um, dysphoria since 2008, but we never had a rule on the books. So this is actually putting it in administrative rule. <coughs> it outlines um, conditions for coverage for genital and breast surgeries, and it expands co coverage in five key ways. It eliminates the 21 year age minimum for coverage. It eliminates hormone therapy as a prerequisite for a mastectomy. It changes the minimum hormone therapy requirement for genital surgeries from 24 to 12 months. It eliminates the sufficient breast development criteria for breast augmentation mammoplasty. And it adds coverage of hair removal when required for certain genital surgeries. Yes. Happy to answer any questions. Senator Bay, actually, a couple questions. You said the hair removal when necessary. What is the necessary component of that? There are um, two procedures in particular that um, vaginoplasty and phalloplasty that require um, permanent hair removal prior to the surgery as a medical necessity prerequisite. And so we are electing to cover those when determined medically necessary to complete those procedures. Um, we do not cover it for um, other cosmetic reasons like facial hair removal. It's, it's purely for when you need permanent hair removal um, to have a surgery performed. I saw one comment that was criticizing the rule for not covering that, and I don't know what the state's response was to that. Uh, we actually made this change in response to the public no, I mean comment. For facial hair. Um, so this surgery is specific to this rule is specific to surgeries. So we are limiting it to surgeries this time. Um, one other question. Uh, noticed a response that said all surgeries under this rule require prior authorization which allows the state to ensure that treating providers are following clinical standards of care and recommending developmentally appropriate treatment and this is in regards to the um, striking of the age 21. can you tell me how that process works i'm not on the committee of jurisdiction so i don't know what the procedure is the individual review procedure mm -hmm. Um, so these surgeries all require prior authorization, um, and we have a clinical team at the Department of Vermont Health Access that reviews all the medical documentation that's submitted with the prior authorization and makes an individual determination of medical necessity um, for each requested procedure. Who is on that committee? It's not a committee, it's a, a clinical staff at the Department of Vermont Health Access. So we have a chief medical officer, we have a clinical director who's a, a you know, registered, we have a team of clinicians made up of registered nurses, social workers, medical doctors. Can I just extend to the Committee of Jurisdiction Chair, at least in the Senate, um, is this a similar process for the abortion question? We recently eliminated the age restrictions. And I'm just curious if this is similar process that's a good question for Medicaid medic you're, you're asking a question about Medicaid <clears throat> so abortion in the, it would be in the professional ethic ethical decision making medical ethical decision making and uh, on site understand the question and the response in the in the discussion over um, third trimester um, abortions there was a you said a professional ethical decision-making process and body that reviewed those 
I'm sorry, I'm not following the abortion well, threat. She's looking for an analogy between how decisions are made here and how decisions are made for that very simple uh, surgical procedure. So we rely on medical doctors and medical providers in the field who are treating um, providers with individuals to make an assessment of medical necessity, and then when prior authorization is necessary, they submit that clinical documentation to DIVA's clinical review team. Um, that's not required in the case of abortion when medically necessary. It is required here, um, and that's due to several reasons, but I, I'm not quite sure of the parallel. Well, I was trying to understand the composition of the individuals who might be asked to review these decisions and what that that type of group we laypersons could, could say, oh, that reminds us of they're, yes, this, they're clinicians. This, this, that, or the other thing. And is the group that's going to review these decisions similar in its makeup to the, the type of review that takes place in the third trimester? Um, and if not, I, I apologize that I'm, I am not aware of what you're talking about when you talk about third trimester. Um, so Medicaid covers abortion in the case of harm to the mother or medical necessity. And then state general fund covers abortion in other instances. Um, we do not have a medical review in those instances. We do have a medical review here for gender affirmation surgeries in which uh, cl clinicians that are state employees review the clinical documentation submitted by the medical providers. So it's not the same process. Well, in the third, tri third trimester process, then it was an, was it an ethical review that takes place? I'm not familiar of Medicaid covering abortion. I, 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 like, I just, I wasn't, I'm sorry. I wasn't tying it to, med, to Medicaid. And I okay. wasn't trying to open up. It's not, so this no. is Medicaid as an insurance payer only. Um, so we're not involved in other, like, maybe, I, I'm sorry. I The third trimester thing is throwing me, but that's not something that our clinical staff is involved with. As a, as, a, as a male of my age, this is different. And we're sitting here seeing the result of a lot of people who've worked very hard to try and come up with a reasonable um, and you know, justifiable and, I would assume, ethical solution to a, a problem that, um, you know, a challenge that many people have. And um, I was wondering. When push comes to shove, who says yes and who says no? And it's unusual <coughs> to go from a, the 21 year old age of decision making um, to a much younger age. And the, one of the, the third trimester issue and that sort of thing is one of the places where those tough decisions have been resolved and passed in statute. So. So I can speak to the 21 age um, restriction being lifted specifically to this rule. Um, Medicaid has to follow something called, we refer to the acronym as EPSDT, it's Early Periodic Screening, Screening Diagnostic and Treatment Services for individuals under 21. And it statutorily prohibits us from um, denying coverage to any particular set of services that may be medically necessary. And so having a 21 um, year of age limit on any particular surgery is in conflict with EPSDT federal regulations. So we did not feel that having an age limit in our rule um, conformed with federal law. And instead, we uh, assert an individual review on individuals under the age of 21. So that's all getting prior author prior authorized and we're reviewing it on a case-by-case -case basis for medical necessity. Individuals under 21 have to meet the same standards um, in order to receive prior authorization as outlined in the rule as any other age. They have to um, live in their, um, the gender identity that they want to transition to for a year prior to any surgeries. They have to have hormones depending on the type of surgery that they want. All the same requirements apply for individuals under 21, but it is not compliant with federal law to have a hard age limit. 
Yes. I'm good. This is a, your committee of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Right. You've signed off as saying this meets statutory intent. Yes, I did. Did you? And the uh, the uh, the statute that's being cited is general authority, I believe. Genius general uh, APA. Is that right? Yes, and the. Uh, and then there's a human services section. That's correct. Um, the <coughs> adoption of rules required to administer medical assistance program under Medicaid. Okay. And Medicaid um, does have federal guidelines to follow, and that's what Ashley was talking about. Do the federal guidelines incorporate the same elimination of age requirement? So the, the federal guidelines um, would not require a state to necessarily cover this for an adult, but do require coverage um, reviewed on an individual basis, regard this service or any other service for individuals under 21 under EPSDT regulations. So EPSDT says even if you don't cover it anywhere else in your Medicaid program, if you could cover it, you have to review on a case-by-case -case basis for individuals under 21. This obviously is a brand new rule something that has a cultural impact, if nothing else. I've never seen it phased. I don't sit on the committee of jurisdiction, so I'm certainly not going to stand in the way of anything here, but I just um, I want to make sure that this committee is approving or denying based on what I understand the legislative intent to be, and I don't know that we've ever actually touched on this subject. We certainly had a, a big conversation about abortion in the last go-around, I see any kind of a medical procedure as having the same um, required discussion, if you will, in the legislative process. So we, we did have a discussion um, a couple of years ago on um, the, what's the counseling, what I'm looking at, my lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the counseling but the uh, yeah the conversion therapy Conver thank you the conversion therapy and so we did go through quite a discussion on 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 a lot of the issues here we did not go through a discussion on the specifics of surgery that would be required but this is consistent with the I, consistent with the intent of the legislature to ensure that uh, people have an opportunity for self-determination and uh, based on um, medical support. Um, I just want to note that I believe that it is in um, statute that mm -hmm. gender affirmation surgery yes, is covered, and I know that Barb Prime from Vermont Legal Aid is able to speak to that more eloquently than I can if, if you have continued questions about this particular area. I don't know what <coughs> When did we put it there? I'm not trying to cause a stir. I'm actually trying to set up my colleagues for a future conversation about why I'm required to wear a hat on my head when I get on board my motorcycle. <coughs> but that's a discussion for me. Public safety. <coughs> my having looked at this, I went, oh, gee whiz, this is a big change in the lives of many people and may very well be a big change for the better and I'm not that's a policy decision um, and I'm not adverse to the big change I I'm always kind of worried when big changes are made without the usual fuss debate and acrimony that sometimes comes with big changes because usually you got to get through that to get to the big change. And if this committee is approving a, a big cultural change, and later on the public goes, where did that come from? Then you know, someone's got to answer that question. This, it, I don't believe this is a big cultural change. I believe this is an uh, acceptance of that which has been going on for a number of years. And I think that the 
the the data is very clear about the need for for this type of surgery for people uh, who identify with a gender different from the one that is expressed genetically. So um, and and we have talked about that these issues in committee. So I don't see this as being contrary to uh, legislative intent. It's very much um, part of um, what what we have talked about. The fact that there isn't a big controversy about it and a large discussion about it, I think, is a tribute to the work that um, has gone on to bring the rule to us in the first place. It, yes, and I would also say we have been covering this since 2008, and we have been making, um, it, we have been covering it for individuals under 21 um, through a, a process that is a lot more onerous than it will be under this new rule. So again, I don't think that there's um, a big substantive change here from what we've been doing since 2008, and it is codified in the state statute that um, this these types of surgeries shall be covered by um, insurance, and Barb can speak to that better than I can, but we uh, certainly are formalizing a lot of our policy in this rule. We've obviously received a lot of comments, and we've made changes that we think um, will make our coverage a lot better for both providers and the individuals receiving these services. There's a lot more clarity there. Um, and we have made um, changes to make sure that we're covering things like hair removal when necessary to receive the surgery. So there, there I don't want to say that there aren't any changes, but we have been covering this for over a decade. Without the rule. With, in turn, with policy, not in administrative rulemaking, yes. And the decision and what we've been doing for the last decade or so to go or no go on these surgeries was made by the clinical unit at the Department of Vermont Health Access. So the same. Regardless of the age. Yes. Something that we will all be hearing a bit more about this in the not too distant future. My understanding is that at birth, often parents and doctors have to make decisions for infants and on, on you know issues of of, of gender um, uncertainty. And newborns, and that that's been going on for years and years and years. Um, and now we're allowing. Um, I, I guess maybe some people would uh, would argue directly for corrections in what those at first <coughs> decisions were. Uh, like a new frontier. So I'm rambling. The chair of the committee. Should they push the chair over here. Are there any further questions for the members? Has a motion been made yet? No. Nope. We have two more witnesses. Two more witnesses. Oh, okay. Excuse me. We have, we have other two witnesses. More witnesses to no. um, my apologies. If I had known we had two more witnesses, I would have withheld my remarks until we heard from. For my questions, we heard from them all. Um, next witness. If there are no further questions for this witness, Thank you. Barbara Prime. Hi. Yeah, I'm bringing Amelia Schlossberg with me. She's from the Office of Vermont Healthcare Advocate at Martin Legal and I'm Barb Prime. I'm a staff attorney at the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid, and um, I really appreciate the committee taking this up and I want to say we are all learning together you know it's it's information that we're all learning about together um, I've been representing people with gender dysphoria for almost as long as I've been in Vermont Legal Aid um, it's a very small part of my practice I've been at Legal Aid 25 years it's a very small part of my practice um, but it is um, for people who are suffering from gender dysphoria, it is a heart-rendering issue when their body does not conform. And 
So one of the questions that you asked about was um, who decides and how do you know? And um, so Medicaid's had a bulletin for a long time that tells doctors like what they need to do to get things approved. And they've, they've taken this bulletin, which was their policy, and actually moved it into regulations. So while this is a new regulation, it's a policy that Medicaid's been using for a long time. And they've been updating as they go, as we all learn together. Um, but what has to happen is doctors and treating professionals have, and therapists have to write letters of medical necessity. And these letters are, um, you know, they are detailed long letters about, and it, they usually include things like um, depression, anxiety, suicidality. They are, um, you know, they are complicated and sad, hard things, and nothing you would want any family member of yours to be dealing with. And that's what makes it medically necessary. It, it's like there's a medical, like this has to happen medically or it is bad for this person not to have it happen. And that's why this is occurring. And you know, I've been representing people. I have never had a client getting this surgery under 15 years old, and I think it would be hard to meet it, or probably very difficult and possible, but like I said, we're all learning to meet the surgery requirements much younger than that because bodies go through puberty, and people have to be living as the other gender. You have puberty blockers, which can block puberty. You have hormone treatments. And the world professional standards, um, there's this group called WPATH, which is the world professional, I don't remember what the A stands for. Association. Uh, Association for Transgender Healthcare has like this big set of how do you know when someone's ready for what. And for trans youth, it's a four step process that you have to go through. So it's, this is, you know, this is not something that happens lightly. It's something that happens with a lot of thought and therapy and going to doctors who are specialists. And, and it's, it's super important. It's super important work. Um, we also have, you know, so one of the things that Ashley talked about is we have a requirement in Medicaid that for Medicaid for adults, you can place some limits on what you provide. But for people under 21, you're not allowed to refuse any medically necessary care, anything that stops proper growth and development, anything that alleviates a condition. So for people under 21, you have to cover everything in Medicaid. For people over 21, you can set limits. And that is why a rule that doesn't allow it for under 21 actually violates federal Medicaid law. And on top of that, in Vermont, we have a health insurance bulletin that came out um, from the Department of Federal Regulation that says all health care, not just Medicaid, but all private insurance has to cover trans health care equivalent to non-trans health care, and that can't discriminate by age. So this Medicaid policy that's happening now is this rule is actually getting things in conformity with federal law. It's getting it in conformity with the Department of Federal Regul our Vermont Department of Federal Regulation, and it's also meeting the the medical criteria of um, of meeting the needs of uh, youth who are you know having a hard time and and so I want to say you said um, Representative McDonald that you're concerned about the fuss and acrimony and the lack of it well we have had some fuss and acrimony but you have gotten to miss that because that mostly happened in the comments which had plenty of acrimony um, that the department received about the rule change in the 200 comments that Ashley talked about. Um, and I want to say, like, I, I, I want to, I realize people are, um, you know, this is new and so people want 
to understand it and be educated and there's concern and it's important to understand why this is happening now. That's completely valid. But I also want to say our Medicaid department has worked really hard to catch up and one of the great things they did early on is we had a meeting with the health care providers, with the, the, the trans youth clinic, the um, surgeons, the doctors, um, and I think we had like, um, I don't know, like nine or so medical providers, and like doctors never leave their offices, but we got like the doctors to leave their offices, the nurses, the social workers, psychiatrists. the psychiatrists to all come in a room and talk about how to make this rule appropriate, developmentally <coughs> appropriate, um, all those parts. So um, a lot of work happened to get us here and um, I really appreciate the work that particularly um, that, that Danny Cuoco and Ashley Berliner did to, to get us here and um, struggling to push through. Um, and it is, you know, super important. And um, I know Amelia has some things she wants to talk about and then we want to answer your questions because we want to help everybody understand this as much as possible. So my name is Amelia Schlossberg. I'm the Communications and Outreach Person for Vermont Legal Aid's Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, and first, I really want to thank Medicaid and the Agency of Human Services for their hard work on improving access to medically necessary care through this rule. Um, I want to particularly thank them for their attention to medical expertise, um, medical experts and providers in this field. I also want to thank them and you all for your attention and responsiveness to public comments and for engaging with transgender and LGBTQ organizations during this process. Access to medically necessary care is a deeply important issue for transgender and gender nonconforming folks, especially in light of the hate and misunderstanding leveled at this community and especially important in light of the disproportionate impacts of poverty and negative social determinants of health on the transgender and gender nonconforming Vermonters. This has been a long and careful collaborative process of improvement, and it will continue to be an ongoing process of improvement as the medical experts at the World Professional Association for Transgender Healthcare will continue to review and update the best clinical practices for treatment of gender dysphoria. And as a staff member of Vermont Legal Aid's Office of the Healthcare Advocate, I'm deeply grateful for this huge progress and for this ongoing collaboration to improve access to medically necessary care for Vermonters. And finally, as a non-binary Vermonter myself, this ongoing commitment to improving healthcare for my community means the world to me. Thank you. Questions for the witness? Witnesses, stand there. I want to thank you for starting out by saying we're all learning. Yeah, um, me too. I'm well, learning too. Let me say that some of us around this table are way further back on the train mm -hmm. than most of you who have been at the engine. Uh, some of us are still hanging off the edge of the caboose trying to grasp what is our responsibility here as legislators. Mm -hmm. As a past chair of Vermont's Human Rights Commission, I'm not ignorant of the problems face on this community. What I am concerned about as a legislator is we have a process we have to go through to justify to all of our constituents mm -hmm. why it is we make decisions in various places. Now as I understand it, we have been actually practicing what is now um, hopefully about to be recorded by rule We've been practicing it essentially since 2008, if I understand that correctly. Um, the process of going through this rulemaking, I've read the comments, I understand the opposition, I understand the proponents, um, I think I have a handle on the issues back and forth. What I'm a little bit nervous about is that that has not happened in the political arena that we mm -hmm. are all engaged in on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little uh, nervous about making a decision 
without having the legislature weighing in on the conversation. And I understand Senator Lyons' position that uh, she feels this has been dealt with in a setting that wasn't quite exactly on the same terms as this, but is parallel to what um, you are making for an argument about how these things progress. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask this question because I don't know the answer. Are we, do we have to vote on this today? Is that a requirement? I don't want to make anybody nervous, but I, I'm trying to think, do I need more time to think about what I'm doing here? Mm -hmm. The reaction that I have in casting my vote to some people will seem that I am approving a procedure that to some of my constituents, um, they match the opponent's version of, of what things are. To other constituents will match what the proponents are in favor of. And I don't know, as I sit here, um, what my own constituency would be telling me about this. Mm -hmm. But I can see people saying, wait a minute, Ben, you have a legislative <coughs> responsibility um, that requires you to examine this issue. And it's unfortunate that I don't sit on the Committee of Jurisdiction, so I'm taking bits and pieces of information trying to wrestle with it. Um, but if I boil it all down, and I'm probably talking through my own decision-making process mm -hmm. here, so forgive me, um, you have been, um, the departments have been practicing literally what is now being asked to be codified since 2008. Um, the best way that I sell this argument then to my constituents would be we are not actually approving or disproving anything other than codifying what the practice has already been. Am I wrong in that assessment? I, I would be careful about saying it's 100% of what's been happening since 2008 because Medicaid has learned as WPATH has gotten clearer, um, but it has, for the very most part, been practicing this. Um, and I would say part of the, what's getting codified is we have a Department of Financial Regulation rule that you can't discriminate right. against transgender people and on age. And you have a federal Medicaid law that says you can't discriminate um, based on age. And there are multiple cases, like lawsuits. I mean, so like as, as Vermont Legal Aid, if Medicaid hadn't done this, we might have thought of a lawsuit. But certainly, there was a demand letter sent to them Mm -hmm. two and a half years ago signed by me saying you have to bring things into conformity. So this is the law. They're putting what is the law into place in regulation. Medicaid has to provide medically necessary care. When doctors say this is medically necessary for this 17 year old, they're not allowed to say no. Yeah. And the Department of Federal Regulation says the same thing and Blue Cross has to do it too and so does Cigna. It's so uh, your, it's logic, your logic yeah. is perfectly simple. Yeah. The headline in tomorrow's Caledonian will be yeah. Benning votes to approve 12 year olds having yeah. Yeah, yeah, gender right. surgery. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I have to deal with yeah. going back home. Yeah. So I look at this, I want to make sure that I'm listening yeah. to you and yeah. having that thought process yeah. is very important. Um, but we are essentially codifying what has been the practice that we have uh, regulations in place that normally would suggest this is something that has to happen and deemed to be medically yeah. necessary. The questions for my constituents will be, how does a 12 year old decide that they have to have a medically yeah. necessary procedure? Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm just wrestling. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've never heard of anyone under 15 in my practice. And, and people come to legal aid when they're unhappy with what happens. So people are pretty good at finding us. And, um, but I, I understand that um, it, it's, it's a, we're all learning together. And, I'm, and I think that, um, you know, I appreciate what you're saying. Appreciate how you're presenting too. 
I'm really happy to answer your questions because I feel like questions is how we learn about this together and how um, how we do a better job going forward and being as inclusive as we possibly can. Mark? Is that clear? So Barbara, in response to Senator Benning, you said you've never heard of anyone under 15. Seeking surgery. Seeking surgery. Yeah. What happens when that under 15 seeks surgery? I mean, right now, it's it's always, it's, it's not easy, but it, you know, it's one of those things that people say, well, I've never heard of anybody doing this. Yeah. At some point in time, somebody is going to do that. Well, I, uh, part of it is because the WPATH standards have these four steps for trans youth that they have to go through, and the steps sort of start around the age of puberty, it's a little difficult for me to understand how it gets much younger than 14, if possible. So that's partly why I'm uh, saying that. Um, but it has to be medically necessary. You have to have been living in the other gender. You have to be taking puberty blockers, if appropriate. You have to be going to therapy. You have to be working with a medical doctor you know those things have to be in place and you have to have it's not just that but it has to be that people are saying it is it is medically bad for you not to have this happen and um you know for for trans youth there is a lot of problems i mean there's a lot i, I think one of the things that is very interesting to me in a very depressing and sad way is the risk to trans youth by our community of getting bullied, beat up, you know, their rates of, you read these letters and you understand the risk of not passing as your gender presents. And it's um, not what, it is not what anyone in this room wants. You know, it is not what we want. And so we have to do things um, to, help, to help get us there. Do you want to say something? Maybe? No, I just want to add what it looks like um, in terms of who's writing these letters of support and explaining the medical necessity. So it would be someone's medical provider. So we're not having 17-year-olds going out and writing their impassioned speeches. Um, it would be a medical professional um, who would be explaining. It would be someone probably with an MD explaining what, um, why this is why the person's experiencing gender dysphoria and why this is a particularly important treatment for their gender dysphoria. So explaining the details of the depression or the suicidality or the um, the issues that are going on for a person. Um, and for a teen, that would be a long relationship with a medical provider. Um, and if you look in the comments or, or when you read comments, you you see um, the medical providers that are weighing in on this, uh, including the UVM. Transgender Youth Clinic um, and the Community Health Centers of Burlington medical doctors um, explaining what their experience has been working with older teenagers um, and this medical necessity um, and their support for access to care when it's medically appropriate and developmentally appropriate. The, the person has to see a, um, a PhD level mental health professional, which is usually a psychiatrist. They have to have their own treating physician. They have to have a mental health provider with a long working relationship. They need all three of those. All of them saying this is medically necessary and why. These are long letters. But is there, so there has to be, is there somewhere that says all three have to be in agreement? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, you don't get through, there are multiple steps to get through the door and you have to have all three of those steps. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for the witnesses? We have one more witness, Senator. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and attention that you're putting into this. Thank you so, so much. I, I, thank you. I think we're ready for our next question. Brenda Churchill, I represent the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont. 
which includes out in the open in uh, Bennington, uh, Queer Connect in Brattleboro, in Chittenden County, uh, Vermont Cares, Outright Vermont, and Pride Center, and in Montpelier, the Rainbow Umbrella of Central Vermont. I know a lot of you, and I want to hope that you will read my testimony um, and understand that while I am so in favor of this happening, there have been a couple things that were pointed out to me by folks who are transgender that I work with and I talk to on a daily basis. And to Senator Benning's point, I wanted to <laughs> point out that while we are all learning, I am teaching. I am talking about this with as many people as I can. I do a program called Ask a Transgender Person that I've done for mental health professionals, schools, um, farmers markets, uh, and have had a great deal of opportunity for public outreach and <coughs> gain support in mostly every encounter. I'm going to boil it down to you um, as simply as I can. What this bill means to me is you're legislating my survival here. And two words that come to mind are murder and suicide. Look at the bottom of my testimony. I mean, you can look at that. I cited two statistics. Additionally, this year, there's been another murder of a transgender woman. So that number needs to change to 19. And probably the most significant thing that you're going to have an effect on today is the suicide attempts for trans folks. Stunningly, 41% of my family tried to commit suicide. Why is these changes or codifying the practices important? It's because it will let people know that these are things that are now looked at by Vermont as part of their right to exist and live in Vermont. I, I want to take any questions that you might have for perhaps the only trans person that works here in the state house. And I'm absolutely open to any questions I've told folks before. Nothing's off the table. And I can always say no, I don't want to answer that question. But that's pretty, pretty few and far between. If you don't know any trans folks, then this might have a significant impact that you know one, uh, me, today. Um, if you do know transgender folks, um, and I hope that you do, this is going to have an impact in a very positive way. And with respect to uh, suicides, anybody who, anybody who doubts that a trans person has their own struggles and their own issues uh, doesn't know human nature very well. To not be able to fit into a society, to be bullied as a kid, to be set aside from participating in many things, including, by the way, healthcare in schools, just as an aside. Um, this is kind of important. Um, anybody have any questions for me? And don't be shy. Why did you frame it in such a way we were actually approving a procedure that has actually been approved for quite some time. Not so much approval as it's codifying into a structure that now medical professionals and providers around this state will understand. This is you, you have you have to follow these rules. And I'm assuming that that's the, the intent of this is to put it in a position where it's out of different pieces of uh, the WPATH, as an example, um, current Medicaid practices. I'm going through this process now. I have my letters. I have things that I haven't done. These things are going to happen, whether this is approved or not, in one way, shape, or form. Trans folks are very resourceful and can get, get the things done, uh, including folks that go out of state. But we have private insurance providers right now that are doing all of this 
because they have mandates, because they have structure from not just Vermont, but also the federal government. So it, it <coughs> Senator Benning, with all due respect, this, this is not necessarily a no-brainer, because I understand that you have to uh, talk to your constituents. I'll go out on the trail with you any time you want. I will be at your side and say, this man supported me, a Vermonter. And that's what I appreciate will happen today. I appreciate that offer. Um, I think I want to make clear that a vote here today, um, if some folks are anticipating we are about to vote to approve something that is brand new and never been done before, which is how it will be postured and presented in various quarters. That's not actually what we're talking about here. And so my, um, I guess, nervousness is when you try to posture it in that way, the political process gets ramped up considerably. And we haven't had this conversation in the legislature. Certainly not to this extent that I'm aware of, and I don't sit on the Committee of Jurisdiction, but I think I'm safe in saying we haven't had that level of conversation in the legislative arena. But some people are going to say, Elcar has leaped ahead and made this policy decision without any kind of legislative discussion other than what is peripherally on the edges of other conversations. <coughs> so I will say we have had conversations. What what we haven't had is this going into statute. So this is in rules. Right. And so it allows for protection of the patient. It allows for a process that ensures that it is medically necessary. I, I'm Junior, I'm 100% comfortable right. I, I understand with where you're what you're saying. Right. If this was a statute, in other words, we would have a committee of jurisdiction looking at the conversation. We'd have a great big battle between the pros and the cons in this legislature. To some extent, there will be angry people out there that we didn't have that process in the legislature. And this will be how it gets presented to us politicians when we're out there talking. I think I can defend at any point in time why folks have medically necessary surgeries and make that explanation. But that's not really what I'm wrestling with right now. What I'm really wrestling with is we're going to make a decision and if we approve the rule, we will be hit by people who say you bypassed the legislative process that normally would have taken place. But the reality is, and I'm thinking through again, we've been doing this for some time. So all that we are technically doing is codifying what has been happening with the understanding that we are aligning this with federal law that requires us not to discriminate. I think I've got that part of it down. Politically, we'll wrestle with it where we have. I'm, I'm available to anybody that has to answer those questions. Appreciate that a lot. And, uh, with that said, and with all due respect, um, if it saves a life, as it has in the past, as it has worked through different processes, whether it be a suicide attempt or an attempted murder or a murder, it's it's done its job. It's done what we really need our legislation to do is to protect us. And I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Ashley, did you want to yes. say something? Ashley Berliner, for the record. We were going to call on you when... Okay. When the questions for this Sorry. witness have okay. been, or and any of the other previous witnesses. Uh, Brenda, can I just ask one more question? Sure. Your testimony, um, you were concerned that this didn't go far enough. Are you, you're not suggesting that we 
disapprove the rule because it doesn't go as far as you would hope to. But That's correct. The work that um, the departments have done, <coughs> what legal aid has done, is, in my words, long overdue and very welcome here. The discrimination that I pointed to within the context of these rules uh, has to do with some nuances that aren't always apparent to people. And within the occurrence of, of transgender folks who transition from either male to female or female to male, there's certain processes that inherently favor trans men versus trans women. One of them is their ability to pass, if that is what they're looking for, by inducing hormones, um, they will have beard growth, right. and they will have a, an appearance that matches the current binary that we're all tied to. <coughs> Trans women will continue to have to uh, shave or remove hair in a way that is both costly and a barrier for a lot of low income or uh, you know, folks that don't make enough money for electrolysis. And facial feminization surgery, again, contributes to their overall well-being and their appearance. So that they may, again, if that's their goal to pass in society, fit the minor and look to themselves as they look in the mirror as the whole person that they believe themselves to be. Both of these procedures are excluded as um, uh, cosmetic surgery and therefore not included, but I would argue that they are not uh, cosmetic surgery but medically necessary life-affirming procedures that really wouldn't add a huge burden to taxpayers but would, again, go a long way to benefit uh, individuals uh, who are seeking these procedures. Um, perhaps I, I would suggest that this may be a continual evolution of process uh, that we look at the good that's been done and the words that have been codified uh, in, uh, in the process today. And uh, we won't be around a while, so I'm sure we'll talk about this again. <coughs> no further questions for this witness? Senator Lyons, did you have a well, question for uh, yeah. I think Ashley wanted to respond to some of the discussion that was going on to clarify. Yes, Senator Benning in particular, uh, and Ashley Berliner for the record. Um, I just wanted to say that I completely appreciate where you're coming from about if this is something that needs to be hashed out in the legislature versus in the administrative rule process. And I would say that um, the, the path that you're going down, we've been covering this since 2008. We have. Um, I, I spoke with Representative Lippert about some of the conversation that happened well before my time in the legislature when Medicaid first started um, thinking about covering this in 2008. And so I do think that the conversation happened a very long time ago. And I would also say that we have, we've been working on this rule for over a year, um, very much in, not in the state house, but very much in the public. We've had multiple Vermont Digger and Burlington Free Press articles written about this rule. We've received lots and lots and lots of public input, as I've already discussed. And I would say that um, we feel as a department that we have clear authority to proceed with this rulemaking. And what our, what my understanding of this committee is, is approving that rulemaking authority and not necessarily the policy in and of itself, um, that the policy discretion is happening um, with the overarching statute that exists on the books that the legislature already weighed in on and then with DIVA's authority to proceed with this rule. I appreciate that actually, but I know what the newspaper reports are gonna be tomorrow and I, I guess I've got enough legislative experience to understand what happens with this walk up and down. Representative <clears throat> Myers. Ashley, or, or maybe this might be for Barbara, either one of you. What you're saying is that federal law allows this, just federal law. 
Does it? Yes, and I would I would go further to say that regardless of this rule, we are mandated by federal law to cover gender affirmation surgery when medically necessary for individuals under 21. And the federal law is explicit that even if it isn't in your rule, even if it isn't explicitly in your state plan, even if it's not in your statute, you have to cover it. It is a violation of federal law not to. Okay, so federal law says that. Yes. If we should say no on this as it's presented to us, what happens to the state of Vermont through federal law? What happens to the state of Vermont in terms of Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera, in regarding this specific rule? Vermont would continue to cover gender affirmation surgery under its existing clinical policy, and we would not have a rule on the books, and it would lead to lots of um, confusion on the behalf of beneficiaries and providers for not know. you know, I would anticipate what has existed for the last 10 years where there's a lot of back and forth to get the right materials, to get the right supporting documentation. The intent of this rule is really to clarify what is required to to receive prior authorization. And without this clarity, um, while we would likely try to put some of it into um, clinical guidance, we would anticipate a lot more confusion on the on the part of providers and what they need to submit, a prolonged process, um, decreased access to care, and potentially more appeals. But I understand that. Would there be reason for the, for the federal government not to, we know how much money comes in through Medicaid to the state of Vermont. Would there be a reason for the federal government to say, well, you're not doing what we're requiring to be done under federal law. We will then cut off or some our funding in some way or other Medicaid funding that would be coming into the state of Vermont. If the state were to reverse its current coverage policy and no longer cover this, it would be in violation of federal law and we would be likely be sued by Vermont Legal Aid um, and we would not be able to defend ourselves in that lawsuit. So I don't think that the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services would be proactive in doing anything, but they would know that they're relying on lawsuits being brought forth, which they certainly would be in this case, um, to enforce their rules. I don't know if you want to add anything. I think you described my role very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Further questions for the witnesses? What's the committee's pleasure? I move that we approve the rule. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All aye. those say nay. Can I make an eye with an explanation? <laughs> sure. That's what I was going to do, too. Why not? <laughs> Are you, beg your pardon, said that? I eyed it, but I would like to make an explanation. <clears throat> start by saying I have enough history on this subject to know that we have a segment of our population uh, that has suffered for a very long time. This is not something, uh, this procedure is not something that people go through simply because they wake up one day and decide they want to do it. Um, I do understand that there is a complicated procedure that folks have to go through, um, that it all is based upon a medical necessity, not a simple will and whim. Uh, for that reason, I understand the need. 
Secondly, I don't think we are actually creating new legislation here. I think that we've been doing this uh, since 2008, and what we are simply doing here uh, is codifying what is in existence in order to protect the state from potential legislation. Uh, so because, A, I believe it's the right thing to do, and B, uh, because it aligns us with what I understand the federal process to be, uh, I'm in favor of having the rule in place. Did you get all that? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Senator, I haven't voted yet either, so <laughs> I'd like to explain. You haven't voted yet? I haven't voted yet. Well, this is a um, I will vote yes on this. However, I vote, I'm vote. i voting for it because I have long held, I have, but my issues with my voting yes is the fact that for as long as I've been in the legislature, it has been very important to me that we have had that full discussion on both the floor of the House and the floor of the Senate to come to some kind of an agreement. I understand, again, we've been doing this since 2008. And so, I don't want to say reluctantly, because I feel it's very important that we offer what we've been offering and continue offering to those people in our community that need this. So I will vote yes still feeling reluctance that we have not had the opportunity to do this on the floor of the House of the Senate. Thank you. Anyone else wish to uh, make a statement? Oh, I, I will. Uh, I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do, um, not because defensive requires to do that. And, um, even though they have, but I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. And I, I know we've had discussions on this uh, often in, in various committees, and this is the buck that's coming through here today, and, uh, it's not, and we're, we're acting on it, and it's um, my statement. So, the vote is, gonna, all in favor say raise your hand, say aye. All in favor say nay. And uh, that's the vote for today. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate it. So, um, next item on the agenda refugee medical assistance. And I have one more item to. Bring up this new business before we finish with the medical um, refugees medical assistance. And the witness for refugees medical assistance. Do we have one? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a policy analyst with the Sorry, it's on my agenda, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, okay. My apologies. Yeah. For the record, your name is? It's Danielle Fiaco. I'm a policy analyst with the Department yep. of Vermont Health Access. Yep. Um, so refugee medical assistance, uh, the rule before you. Um, this is kind of a, it's a small program, um, very individualized. The rule had not been updated since well before the Affordable Care Act was passed. Um, in an effort to update agency rules uh, we and get rid of um, some outdated information we updated this rule. Um, it uh, is updated to align with federal law and guidance. Um, it reflects the current medical assistance programs that we have in Vermont now with the ACA um, and methodology for calculating eligibility. Um, the uh, updates is it expands the length of time for the agency of human services has to process an application from 30 days to 45 days and this aligns with um, a recent change in the health benefits eligibility and enrollment rules for Medicaid. 
Um, it expands the financial eligibility limit for the refugee medical assistance program to 200% of the federal poverty level, um, which is an option provided to states under federal law. Um, and there were no comments received on this during the proposed, during the comment period, a hearing was held, um, no one attended for this rule, and so no changes were subsequently made from the proposed rule. And just a quick explanation, um, because it often gets confused, refugee medical assistance is not Medicaid, um, so when refugees arrive, they are screened for Medicaid first, and if for some reason they are not eligible, they are then screened for the Refugee Medical Assistance Program. So it's in addition to Medicaid? Yes, it's specifically for um, refugees and asylees. It's provided under a different part of federal law that is not <coughs> Medicaid law, um, but it is very closely tied to the Medicaid <coughs> program in the sense that it relies on um, the uh, people who, people have to be first um, screened for oh, being found ineligible, um, and then they are screened by the same folks over at DIVA for this refugee medical assistance program that has additional um, criteria uh, specific to immigration status and um, codified in federal law. Thank you. So you are saying that the refugees are not recipients of Medicaid and that what the rule deals with a program that is separate and distinct from Medicaid. Yes, it's yeah. hard it's hard to see that it's separate and distinct. Once they are found eligible for refugee medical assistance, they essentially receive the same benefits as Medicaid. Um, but it is it funded it's funded entirely Medicaid. by it's not this Medicaid. program. Yeah. Yes. So they, they mimic yes, it closely mimics Medicaid. Yeah. So the eligibility period is determined yearly based on federal rules. Can you just briefly talk about what what those rules can include and how one might be allowed to stay on? Is it all economic eligibility or are there additional considerations? Um, so the eligibility period is currently eight months for refugee medical assistance. Um, and then annually, the director of the federal director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement um, can change that. Um, they have to provide notice, I believe, through the Federal Register if that does change. It has not changed in a while. Um, so if someone, and I think maybe you're getting it, <clears throat> how are they eligible beyond Medicaid? Mm -hmm. um, so they would be screened for Medicaid, and if they were over income, for example, as an adult, uh, because the Medicaid income limit for adults is 133% of the federal poverty level, and this is 200. Um, they would then, you would follow the, um, the criteria outlined in this rule, um, and also use the 200% federal poverty level limit. Will this be integrated into our integrated eligibility uh, program once it's online? Uh, so it's, I'm not, I know, I'm not sure if I can correctly answer that specific okay, question. Okay, they don't have to answer that. The it's eligibility a, is worked yeah. into our rules and Yeah, <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any further questions? How Any many witnesses? How many refugees do we currently have uh, following the RMA? So for federal fiscal year 2019, there were two people on the RMA program. The year before that, there were three. Um, with the ACA expansion, most refugees became eligible for Medicaid. Um, and so this is just really in place as kind of a catch-all. Oh, well, this is a, a question maybe we can talk about another time, but moving that eligibility to a state subsidized program might remove the federal subsidy. So anyway, we can talk about that sometime. Do we have a motion? All right, I'll move that we approve the rules, the number. P50. What was P50. It? Oh, P50. 19 P50. The move that 19 P50 agency that human service rich refugee medical assistance will be approved. 
There's no further discussion. All the papers say aye. 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 All those say nay. Okay, 19 P51, Agency of Natural Resources and Regulations, Visitor Conduct and Fees for the State Park Services. I thought Ashley Berliner was going to do this one too. <laughs> 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 Have a good one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> They're just getting right. nervous. <laughs> Craig Whipple, Director of State Parks, Department of Forest Parks of the Agency. It was cruel. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I don't know who put us last on your agenda, but I was, I'm always grateful for that because you have fascinating subjects. <laughs> uh, don't end me yet. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. So, yes, I'm Craig Whipple, I'm Director of State Parks. Um, we're here to talk about our uh, standard suite of rules that uh, attempt to uh, provide standards for visitor conduct in state parks. It also includes our uh, fees that we charge for services that we sell, um, and also for commercial use of uh, forest parks and recreation. Um, this round, um, these rules have been in effect for decades. Um, this round is largely um, a, a group of editorial or administrative changes, just to tidy things up. In our world, the only things of substance, relative to your previous conversations, it is about substance, but in our world, um, we're talking about uh, raising the price for uh, camping, uh, 10 cents, a dollar per night, uh, lean twos, three dollars per night. Um, there's a, there's a, a proposed change in the rule about um, dogs and pets um, to be um, uh, restrained on a leash um, at all times. Um, the previous rule said um, that they had to be on a, on a leash during the operating season. Um, we have situations um, across the park system now where in the non-operating season we're really quite busy. It's a density issue and there are dogs running around and biting other dogs and people. And we, we have to sort of wrestle that one. So we're, we're proposing to, to require pets on leash at all times. Um, beyond that, I think there isn't a whole lot of substance. I'd be happy to address any of the administrative or editorial changes or anything else that's on your mind relative to this. Can I ask a question? Certainly. Um, so just looking at the various charges and fees that are in here, how many of these are currently in placed into the fee bill? None of them. Okay, so they're all, this is all consistent with what has happened previously? Correct. The oh, statute sorry. allows the um, Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources to, and the, the Commissioner of Forest Parks and Migration to establish fees for um, the sales of services on department lands um, by rule, as opposed to a legislative through the fee bill. It's been like that for a um, hundred years. Uh, almost. Okay. 2024 is our hundredth anniversary. Yes. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's my only question. Representative Myers. Mr. Whipple, I just want to say that I was especially pleased to see in this rule the comments regarding the uh, rule regarding uh, restraining animal, uh, dogs. We have Indian Rook Park in Essex, which is not a state park, but it is a community park. And we are constantly having problems with that decision and making that and what's happening there so not that this is necessarily going to get back to those people because we're trying to work it through you know <laughs> through the town but i appreciate that because i understand every dog owner i used to raise breed and raise dogs and I understand every dog owner feels that their dog's the best and nothing's ever going to happen but unfortunately things do happen so I'm really glad that we're going through that. Somebody else's dog always. Yeah. And the famous last words is oh don't worry it's friendly. Yeah yeah. <laughs> um, but, but thank you for that that mention. Um, we are the, the largest and, and busiest uh, park system in the state. So other park systems look to us for guidance. Yeah. When we do things, often others are. And we, we felt that this was a necessary yes. response. Thank you for that. And with that, 
we have no other questions, I will move approval of this rule. 19P51. P50, oh, sorry about that. No, P51, I'm sorry. All those in favor, any further discussion? If not, all in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. For the record, could you please identify yourselves? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm Keith Levinson, Department of Public Service. I'm Megan Ludwig, I'm the Department of Public Service. And I'm Chris Grand, I'm a senior researcher advocate with the Applying Standards Awareness Project. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, we're here to present uh, the Department's proposed Rule 19E-039, the Appliance Efficiencies Rule. Um, this rule um, was developed by the Department of Public Service to fulfill our obligation under Act 139. Um, it sets forth minimum efficiency standards for the 17 products in 9 BSA Section 2792, um, for which the state's efficiency standards have not yet been applied. Um, and this, this applies to 17 products, which includes air compressors, commercial dishwashers, commercial fryers, commercial hot food holding cabinets, commercial steam cookers, computers and computer monitors, faucets, high color rendering and index fluorescent lamps, portable air conditioners, portable electric spas, residential ventilating fans, shower heads, spray sprinkler bodies, uninterrupted power supplies, urinals, and water coolers. Um, and in the rule, we have um, incorporated by reference the standards that the legislature directed us to, um, to adopt. And um, that is what the rule does. And we're happy to entertain any questions. Chair of Natural Resources from the Senate is not here and probably have the, the best questions should there be any, but he has, do we have an official paper on that? Just, no. No, we didn't, didn't see one. Yeah, well, pass along hearsay that he was fine with the rules, that's hearsay. He usually gives you to us that. Oh, that's right. We did hold a public hearing, there were, no one um, attended the hearing, and we did not receive any comments. I remember the first time we did, we uh, passed the appliance efficiency standards, we um, allowed for rules to be promulgated based on federal standards through the DOE, and is that, this is consistent with, with that process. It's different. It's slightly different. different. Yeah, the, the first um, appliance standards uh, rule that we promulgated was a, it was designed to go into effect if DOE withdrew their standards. That's right. So it was a very unusual in that respect, yeah. and, and I remember the discussion about that. This, this covers products that are not covered by federal standards, but we are incorporating by reference <coughs> other standards in other states, um, the Energy Star program through DOE, et cetera. So, California standards? California, uh, several of them are California standards, yeah. Yeah, or, or reference. Right. Yeah. Which we have. We've incorporated by reference. from the mid 90s is to. Been to Incorporate right. California standards. Yeah. I'm good. Any questions for the witnesses? This is going to make my little computer cost more. Mm -hmm. I'll pass that to Chris. <laughs> what? So the economic impacts, I guess, sure. is what I'm asking about. Sure. Um, so the the. The Vermont standards for computers and monitors are directly taken from the, the California standards for the same. And um, that is, uh, I'm not trying to duck the question, Senator, but it's a very difficult one to answer because of the rapid evolution of the technology. Um, all of the, um, of the efficiency requirements that are being uh, uh, put in place in California and, and, and in Vermont and now uh, three other states which have adopted it 
are ones with readily available technology. And uh, what I would say is that maybe in, for the first year it will cause price increases, but as uh, volume rules in electronics, and uh, I wouldn't expect to see uh, durable of price increases for, for computers over time. But that's just my opinion. As long as China keeps producing them. Uh, and Taiwan and Vietnam, and that's a, a global industry now. Yeah. Thank the you. rational thinking behind it is that eventually over time the efficiency will offset to some extent whatever additional cost you have. That, that's an excellent point. I uh, want to stress that all of these standards have been subject to a uh, life cycle cost analysis as part of the, the development process. So the idea is that uh, customers do recover uh, even very conservative estimates of, of, of projected increases in costs, and there's actually been some analysis that shows that DOE's estimates of those costs and, and, and our, frankly, our estimates of those costs over time have been overstated. So, industry has a way of driving down prices uh, for energy efficient equipment as it enters the mainstream. Any questions? I believe the economic analysis that we were given said that uh, there will be fewer sales and it was targeted towards uh, retailers. And, uh, and it didn't say that people with uh, inefficient stuff would be more likely to hang on to it a little longer if, if the prices were higher. But it, uh, the difference between those two Truisms and to pick one versus the other is just where perhaps your emphasis would be or what you thought was more harmful, the, the seller or the or the buyer of waiting a little longer. Can I ask another, uh, this, this is probably not maybe tangential to the rule, but there's public health data that indicates that the blue light from the screen uh, stimulates the development of macular degeneration, and I'm, if, will, will this, how will this, if, if at all, how, if at all, will this um, relate to that? Do we know? I'm not familiar. It's a little bit beyond. Yeah, my it is. Expertise. I mean, it's, it's clearly um, it is. It's it's energy efficiency, but yeah. it's interesting whether or not there's any conversation outside of this rulemaking process that would lead to a light that is less. Any insight on that, Chris? Um, what I what I would say is that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, at the federal level, um, statute actually restricts the, the um, non-energy criteria that uh, DOE can consider when setting the standards. States aren't limited in that way, and actually even at the federal level there is some uh, particular latitude that's around, uh, allowed around light sources. The area that you're describing is, is one of active research right now, and it's not just with macular generation but also was disrupting um, circadian rhythms and things like that so yeah there's a lot of, of attention being paid because this is around LEDs particularly in their computers and smart uh, 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 smartphone screens and light bulbs and everything now so really understanding that is, uh, is something that a lot of people are working on um, there aren't any conclusions yet at least none that I'm comfortable with pointing to, there's no reason though why that can't be addressed in, in future standards in the way that things like uh, color of, uh, other, otherwise color of light or what they call color rendering index has been and, and there also are no technical barriers, there's nothing endemic to LEDs that requires them to have uh, more blue light. So I think, I think it, in the short story there is if states want to regulate that in the future, they can. And uh, I would expect there to be a lot better information to, to design these regulations on in the near future. Does that directly relate to energy efficiency of the source? 
it, 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 more tangential. Health. It's more tangential. Yeah. yeah, it has to do with the technology behind mm -hmm. lighting the diodes. Mm -hmm. So good. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Any other questions for the witnesses? Committee, what's your pleasure? I'll make approval. Seven wires. Who's approval? Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. It's here to have it. Take two, and rule has been approved. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. The last item on the written agenda um, committee review of response to objection and draft memo to committees of jurisdiction, residential building energy standards, and commercial building energy standards. As I said, I got one more item for the end. Uh, so to just summarize, the last agenda item relates to the RVs and CVs rules that LCAR reviewed at your uh, last meeting. Uh, at that meeting, you had approved the substance of the rule, but did object to the portion of both of those rules that would place a copyright on the rules on behalf of the private entity, IECC, the International Energy Code Council. Um, because the copyright existed there, um, because much of the rule was just was based on the ICC, the International Code Council, um, and then with Vermont specific tweaks. So LCAR did issue an objection solely on the basis of that copyright. Uh, the Commissioner of Public Service responded, um, and in the response you have before you, um, the Commissioner indicated that the Department of Public Service would welcome an opportunity to cure that copyright defect and in order to um, give the department some time to work on a revision to the rule that would keep the substance of the rules as is but would address that copyright issue, the department, um, as I understand it, is going to uh, take a little bit of time to figure out how to revise the rules to not have the copyright on the rule. So the department did provide to LCAR an extension of its review period. Um, that review period extension is now um, to December 20th of this year that LCAR would have to review the rule. Uh, DPS, I have, believe, has until January to finally adopt the rule. And what I understand that DPS will do in between now and then is to come back with, to LCAR with a revision um, so that LCAR can actually see the revision and then determine whether to certify the objection or if it um, addresses your concerns about the copyright and you could move forward and approve the rule if you chose to do so. Um, so that's the status of the objection um, that you'll be seeing that rule again and you'll have time to review it. The second thing that's on related to those two rules is the draft memo to committees of jurisdiction. LCAR did request that a memo go out to committees of jurisdiction at your meeting to uh, highlight for the committees of jurisdiction some of the substantive issues that were raised about RBs and CDs. And so what I have attempted to do here is to lay out the main issues that were discussed in testimony. Um, those are in this draft memo here. Um, the memo would address the design implications that were discussed, um, the lack of enforcement, particularly for Arby's. There were recommendations for a builder registry and that DPS um, should have someone or an entity um, available for informational assistance to the builders attempting to comply with Arby's and CDs. And then, of course, that the changes would have funding implications. Um, the memo takes no position on the recommendations made in witness testimony, but was um, drafted to give the committees an, um, uh, information on the concerns that were expressed in regard to the policy enacted by the General Assembly. Uh, this draft memo is still in draft form. You see it right now refers to the objection, um, but LCAR may reconsider whether to certify the objection. So I was thinking that you could review this memo now to just while this issue is fresh enough in your minds, um, but perhaps Elkar would want to 
hold off on sending it to committees um, until after you take final action on the rule, including on whether to certify the objection. Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I think it does express very well the concerns that we had, the comments that we had. Uh, and, um, but I do, I, I agree. We should wait until the final rule goes through the process. Will that require an action on our part? Will it, to decide to wait for the final rule? Or? Um, well, now you have, LCAR has that uh, been granted the extension of the review period, so I think it'll just be a matter of when DPS is able to resubmit the rule with its revisions addressing the copyright issue. And during the extension of the review period, the provisions of the rules that LCAR did not object to <coughs> remain in abeyance, or, well, so or will, they, will they start forward on their own? So DPS, um, as I understand it, will not move forward with adopting the rule until uh, LCAR gets to see the final version. Um, okay. so, yeah, Just double checking so we're all operating on the same, same way. Uh, I'm sorry, I, Senator Lyons, what did you say about the letter to the committees? I, I, I think we should hold off until the final rule has been approved or not approved. I think that, that that's Ian's okay. suggestion. Well, I'm happy to accept any recommended revisions um, to any of the substance if, if you don't think it addresses enough or too much. You, you and I mean you indicated that maybe that footnote note should go, but that depends on what happens. Correct. <laughs> so. So you're not. Worried. I don't think Elkar needs to take any action on this yep. now. No. We thank the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we we thank you for having <laughs> put on paper that the, the previous meeting uh, asked you to put on paper. So was that it for this? I declare that's it for this. But based, on, based upon that, I would, um, the chair was in error on approving in the approval of the minutes because I was, did not attend the last okay. meeting, which left a four vote approval, which is one short, I think, of okay. what's required. So yes. at the next meeting, um, we would perhaps be in order to ratify or to, to confirm the, uh, the approval done today. But, uh, Minutes. Yeah. 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 And um, secondly, um, I, Sam Alliance and myself have put in a drafting request for a bill that deals with um, how health officers um, pursue, pursue rabies, uh, uh, animal bite bites, and their health officer's responsibility to the rabies protection. And Senator Lyons and I are, are put the bill in because it appears that the guidelines published by the, um, the health department dealing with health officers tasks that they are supposed to perform and the judgments and procedures that those health officers do in fact perform. Um, such as quarantining of animals um, that don't have uh, rabies shots or this, that, or the next, or and how those quarantines take place have been um, have been have have been lack the rules of enforcement of law, and um, they're just guidelines, and they have caused some confusion, which the committee of jurisdiction might seek to take testimony on. A remedy would be for the Committee of Jurisdiction to um, to direct the Department of Health to, to promulgate such rules. Um, the LCAR uh, also has, according to our attorney, um, the authority to direct the Health Department to initiate such rules, but not necessarily to pull the trigger to make them take place. So at the next meeting, um, I would ask that we consider 
um, asking the health department to initiate the rules at the same time that we um, might send a letter to the Committee of Jurisdiction informing them that the rules to deal with these issues have been, been we directed the health department to, uh, to put forth with the rules so they would be getting started by the time the legislature convenes and it might help the Committees of Jurisdiction to be, know that the rules process was already in, up and going. So, Senator, but, but I, it, yeah. any decision on this would be, I would ask that the committee take up at its next meeting with a more thorough uh, explanation of what I've just right. given it. We're going to need information yes. just to do that. And I think some of that information would be fully vetted in a committee process. Uh, it, I have a just, list of yeah. things that the committee might want to deal with and that we might be asking the health department to deal with, such as if you quarantine a dog, what, do you have to give paperwork to the to the, the kennel and can they release a dog without some sort of official whatever and it's, right now it's kind of loosey-goosey so and the other the other piece here. of it I think is um, that it it does it is it involves local decision-making yeah. select boards and then if we start talking about that then it does get into having money to support some of this and whether that comes from the select board or from the Department of Health. So I, th I, I think um, um, we just need to make sure that we're not stepping in the middle of the hornet's nest the way my sister did last week. <laughs> Literally? <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> so there have been cases where the health officer has discharged the health officer's duty in the, according to the booklet with the guidelines and procedures and the, then the health department has said hey, yeah. you shouldn't have done that. And we just need a guideline. Just need some clarity. Knows what Absolutely supposed need to do, clarity. And um, there's, anyway. right. so at the next meeting we might get a, a more organized um, proposal for the card to consider or reject. But this was a heads up. Can I ask? Senator Lance. Uh, so. I'm looking at the rules that we have outstanding. Are we are we continuing to get other rules? I think there are just two on that list. Um, right there's now. only two uh -huh. right now. We're the thirty first, <laughs> but I'm expecting seven from the <coughs> Agency of Human Services. Great. That have very little changes, but yeah. So that's they're gonna be on the thirty first. Oh. Also. And that meeting is not going to be here because uh, the state house that's is gonna be we are in the Maybe we should do it in Chittenden County. <laughs> 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 oh, we're just going to national life, right? <laughs> it's actually yeah. 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 yeah, good. So no meeting on the 17th. No meeting on the 17th. Yes. Oh, shucks. <laughs> With that, I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so there is moved to the committee adjourn. Right. Yeah, no further discussion. Can we say hi? Hi. 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 Hi